Okay, so just one talk today, and it's me, so I'm going to introduce myself. Um, so I'm Martin Chorley, and I am a lecturer here in the School of Computer Science and Informatics. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some work that I was doing probably around about three, four years ago, um, which I have presented at like proper research conferences and things before, but haven't ever spoken about in public, but I think is quite interesting, hopefully. Um, and unlike the other talk I gave where I was talking about beer a lot, um, this is Python all the way up. Uh, so the, the beer talk was a bit of a fake because all the data collection that I'm doing when I'm collecting um, beer data is done in JavaScript um, because it's better. Uh, whereas this was all Python for the data collection and the analysis. So I'm going to talk through a couple of different bits of work. Um, so I am a computer scientist some reason, the picture has disappeared off my slide, which is a shame, because I had a good picture about illustrating how I'm a computer scientist. Um, in fact, all of my pictures have disappeared. Oh dear. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> this is, uh, let's try this again. And this is the bit now where uh, I reopen the talk and the slides don't work on the live stream. Let's see. Hey, Daniel. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, here we go. Let's try that again, shall we? exit back out and check that the live stream is still working. Um, but yes, I am a computer scientist, um, allegedly. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. So if there are any psychologists in the room, are there any psychologists in the room? OK, sort of. Good. Oh, we'll, we'll go with sort of. Um, I am about to massacre some quite basic psychological concepts, I think. Um, so please do forgive me. Um, but it is not my field. But we did abuse it for a bit of research for a couple of years. Um, and that worked out quite nicely. So the research group that I am mostly involved with um, still and was working with at the time um, is all to do with people, people and computing. We do mobile computing, social computing. Um, we do a bit of psychological computing. Um, and one of the problems that we try to solve is um, the exact problem that a lot of people had about 10 minutes ago. There were a lot of people sat around in this room waiting for this talk to begin, and everybody was on their phone trying to find something interesting to fill those five minutes before the talk, right? And it's a thing that a lot of people do. You stood at the bus stop, you're waiting, you pull out your phone, you have a look for something interesting to fill some time, right? Um, but that's quite an involved process at the moment because you pull out your phone, you've got to think, oh, what am I going to look at? I'll have a look at Twitter, have a scroll through Twitter, see if anyone said anything interesting. There's nothing interesting there. I'll go and have a look at Facebook, see if. Anybody's uploaded a baby picture that is mildly diverting for five minutes, and you scroll through that, and there's nothing. So, like, okay, I'll go and read Reddit for a minute or something, right? And you're scrolling through trying to find the right content. We think it'd be much better if you didn't have to do that. If you just take your phone out, and not only does your phone know where you are and that you've got about five or ten minutes to kill, but it knows exactly what content will fill that time, right? So rather than you having to go and find the content, either the content will find you or some software will find the content and present it to you. Um, of course, this is an incredibly tricky challenge. Right? The amount of content being created all the time is huge. The amount of content out there on the internet is huge. There's so many different services that people can stick their photos and inane thoughts into that it could be difficult to try and bring all that down and filter it all down and prevent, present to a user what's most relevant. Right? So this is what we're trying to do. Take all of that content, pick something that isn't necessarily something that you're going to like, 
but is something that's going to cause an emotional response, right? We've got enough problems with echo chambers and filter bubbles. We don't want to make that any worse, right? We don't want, just want to present you with things that are like, oh, yeah, I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that, I like that, right? We don't care whether it makes you angry. We just want you to have some emotional response. For us, the bad thing isn't, my God, I hate this. The bad thing is I have absolutely no feelings about this, right? So we don't care whether it's good or, or negative. It's just something that's going to give you some response. So that was kind of the driver of a lot of our work um, for quite a while. And one of the things we wanted to be able to do was to assess how people give value to content, right? How do people look at content and think, yeah, that's good, that's bad? How are people making the decision over whether they should read something or not? And that's about the time that we found out about this, uh, which is the recognition heuristic, right? Which says if you have two things presented to you, you recognize one, you don't recognize the other, you're probably going to give the higher value to the thing you recognize. Right? So um, there are experiments done where people are presented with bits of information and asked to pick between them, and they generally go with the one they recognize. So you'll ask people to predict the outcome of football results, and people will predict them based on picking the cities that they've heard of because they're bigger. And then you know they generally get things, get things right. So we wanted to know whether this thing, this kind of decision-making process, was what was going on when people are reading social media, when they're looking at content online. Is this happening? Um, so we decided to build an experiment. Uh, at the time that we started doing this, I'd not really done any serious web development, I don't think. A bit of HTML and CSS and JavaScript, a bunch of front-end stuff, but I'd never done any server-side um, development. And it was one of those nice opportunities that you suddenly have when you're doing your job and you suddenly think, hang on, I can kind of push things in a certain direction and I'll get to work on something I want to do anyway, but for my job. So rather than doing, I think at the time we were doing a lot of work, um, myself and Walter over there, were doing a lot of work um, doing things like building mobility models in C and C++ and simulating um, people moving around. And actually, it's a shame Vince not, isn't here because that work was all to do with the prisoner's dilemma. Um, we were simulating cooperation with the prisoner's dilemma, so it was right up history. Um, but I wanted to do a bit of web, so that's what I did. Pushed it in that direction and built an experiment in Django. The tweet cues experiment, we called it, because uh, it was all about the cues that people use when they're reading Twitter to decide whether to read something or not. Um, the idea was you go along, sign in with your Twitter account, and assuming you met our basic criteria for a, a level of activity on Twitter that meant we could use your account. You had to be following a certain number of people and be followed by a certain number of people. I think you had to have tweeted a certain number of times. Um, so you couldn't just sign up for a Twitter account that day to take part in the experiment. You had to have actually been a Twitter user. What we'd do is we'd, you'd sign in as a Twitter user. We'd go to Twitter and grab your timeline, essentially what you would see if you logged into twitter.com at that moment. So we'd grab 200 recent tweets that you would see. And we'd pair them up with another few hundred tweets that you had absolutely no chance of seeing. If you went to Twitter, you wouldn't see them because you didn't follow those people. They weren't people that were in, within your sphere. And then what we do is we'd show you some information. So we'd show you some information about two tweets, one of which would come from your timeline and one of which would be from a stranger. Um, in this case here, we're showing you the name of the person. And just ask which tweet would you prefer to read? The thinking being that if you recognize the user and the recognition of the user is the thing that drives wanting to consume the content, you'll pick the user you recognize, we'll show you the tweet, and you go on to the next question. So we built this experiment, we put it live. The code is online um, on GitHub. It's very, very old. Four years ago was the last time it was touched. So we're talking Django, I think it was about 1.3 was the version number I was dealing with. I don't know what we're up to now. Right, okay. Yeah, so quite a while ago. I mean, this is sort of pre-migrations is when I was doing, doing this work. So that might not even be the most recent code because I'm pretty sure there were some bug fixes that just got deployed straight to live and um, we won't talk about that. What there is, though, um, what I also made at the same time, which is actually a fairly popular repository for me, um, was a Django Tweepy app, which is sort of all the Twitter authentication stuff 
taken out of that experiment. So if you want to build a Django app that has Twitter authentication built in, that's kind of a skeleton, again, if you're using an old version of Django, but it probably wouldn't take too much to uh, get it up to date. Um, so we'd present all these different bits of information and ask people to pick which tweet they'd like to read. So we could show single bits of information, so the user's screen name or their name or um, their profile picture. Um, and we could show numerical bits of information as well. So we'd show how many followers the person has, how many people they were following, how many tweets they'd made, um, and how many retweets the tweet itself had got. Uh, so we'd show single cues to see how they affected things, and then we'd put them together as well. So we'd show multiple cues at the same time, multiple bits of information. So we'd show profile image, screen name, name, and how many followers they have, and ask you to pick which one you want to read. The idea being that essentially we show enough of these different combinations to enough different people, we can start to unpick which particular cues are having an effect on, on which people would like to read. And we did this, we put it online. Um, we had one experiment run where we just essentially released it into the wild and got people to tweet about it and it spread and we collected some participants. And then we repeated it again where we actually paid people to participate through Mechanical Turk. Um, through Crowdflower and got a bit of a larger data set. Um, the results between the two data sets are very similar, um, which is nice. So key thing is that in the absence of any other information, the recognition heuristic does seem to apply. People are going for the things that they recognize. So I show you a tweet from your mate Dave and I show you some other tweet, you'll probably go for the tweet from your mate Dave, right? which kind of makes sense is understandable. That happens in about 88% of the cases. So it's not like a slight preference, it is quite a large preference for people wanting to see the content that they have already chosen to see in their timeline. In terms of numbers, the only thing that's important is the number of retweets. It doesn't matter how many followers you've got, how many people you're following, or how many tweets you've written, um, number of ret retweets is all that matters. So if I just tell you this tweet's been retweeted 10 times, this tweet's been retweeted, a hundred times, people are going to go for the bigger number of retweets, about 85% of the time. So not quite as strong as just the friendship link, um, but you know, pretty much there. What I think is really interesting about this is that the friendship information is always stronger than the numerical information. So if I show you two tweets, I say this one's from your friend Dave, it's been retweeted twice, and another tweet and say this is from somebody you don't know, but it's been retwe retweeted 40,000 times people will still go for the one from their friend Dave most of the time. Okay, so that friendship link, the, the fact that you recognize where that's coming from um, is much, much stronger than the numerical information. Um, and I think it's interesting that you can see that Facebook, when they're injecting stuff into your newsfeed, will always try and link it back to other people. They will say, you know, two of your friends like this and give you their names. Whereas Twitter, when they're injecting stuff into your feed, just say this is a promoted tweet and don't have that link. And perhaps maybe they might get more engagement if they'd said, you know, this person is followed by somebody you follow and add in that little bit of recognition there. Um, but I'm not going to tell them that because I don't want to see more adverts in my feed. Um, so that was a little bit of work we did on Twitter. The main thing that I'm going to talk about today um, is kind of connected to that, uh, but it's a slightly different area. We started to s get a bit more specific on the type of content we were trying to provide to people. And at the same time, we had um, a few people on the team who were very interested in the idea of place and places and what that means. And so we came to this sort of scenario of you're new to a city, you don't know the city, you don't know anyone. Um, you need to find somewhere to eat, you need to find somewhere to sleep, you need to find interesting things to do. What do you do? Right Now, probably most of us, assuming we're in a city where we happen to have data, would, again, straight on the phone, TripAdvisor, Yelp, some sort of recommendation service, Google Places maybe, um, maybe even Foursquare, perhaps. Um, and we'd find something out. And we thought, well, maybe can we recommend places a different way? And this kind of led us down this rabbit hole. Now, does anybody use Foursquare? Excellent, a whole two people. 
Um, or Swarm. Some people might come, come to it new and know it as Swarm. The two things used to be the same, Foursquare and Swarm, and then they split off. Um, Foursquare is all about places. Essentially, if there is a place, it's probably in Foursquare's database. This is like a user curated database of everywhere. Um, places have ratings, they have a lot of metadata information about where they are, they have categories, uh, you can post photos, you can post tips, and you can see people who have been to these places. So Foursquare's main business model is around recommending places for you to go, essentially. Uh, so it's a place recommendation app. Um, Swarm is slightly different. Swarm is the social check-in part of Foursquare broken off into a new app, and that's about checking in places and saying, hey, I'm here, um, which I do a lot. Um, so I check in pretty much everywhere I go and have done for coming up on seven years, I think. Um, which is great. And there's a the whole social aspect to Swarm, so you can see where your friends are, your friends can see where you are, so you can like nicely avoid each other and not have any of those uncomfortable, oh, it's you, things. Um, or, you know, you can see, you know, when you, when you get to um, that point where you're suddenly just in all the time and you never go out, you can see all your friends still out having a really good time, um, which, is, which is great. I used to have a joke where I was always going out and checking in at pubs and clubs and restaurants and bars and having a lot of fun. And um, my boss, uh, he's now the head of school, would just be checking in like at home and work, and, and that was it. And I'd be like, ah, oh, great, isn't that funny? And now all I check in at is work and home because I now have a small child and see exactly where he's coming from because I see all my friends out at bars, clubs, and restaurants all the time. Um, living my life as I used to have it. So it's great for, you know, that whole thing. Um, so they're two pretty useful apps, but they're really useful. Um, there's a lot of data in there. This is three months worth of Foursquare check-ins. Um, you see pretty much shape, shape of the world, right? It's recognizable. There's enough people checking in enough times every day that over three months we can build a fairly passable outline of the globe. Um, Obviously, there's some dark spots and some areas. Either people don't live there or Foursquare is not that popular there. Um, but there's a fair amount of data. And what you end up with is this um, kind of nice diary aspect. Mm -hmm. If you're checking in everywhere, you get a, a kind of log of what you've been up to. This is me hopping around Cardiff in the end of 2010. It's the beginning of 2011. Um, you know, mainly work, town centre, arts clubs, down to the bay maybe, whatever. Um, and you get this neat, neat kind of diary aspect. So as a computer science researcher who's really interested in people, this is fantastic because previously none of that data would have been available, right? People might have been writing it in their diary. You might have been writing down, oh, today I went to the park, it was lovely. You know, maybe if you're that kind of journalist. But getting that data for research would, would have been really, really hard, right? We, we're talking two or three diaries maybe of, of willing volunteers or maybe funding some sort of big study where you're getting people to log it. But now people are just logging it on their phone for fun, and we can get this data, and we can start doing stuff with it. So what I'm going to do is um, a very quick little bit of uh, live coding to show you accessing this, um, this Foursquare data. Uh, if I can find the other window. Good news, the slides are still working on the live stream. Uh -huh. That's not it. There we go. OK, so what I've got is um, obviously Python notebook, because this is PyDiff, and it's not a PyDiff talk if there isn't a Python notebook. Um, requests is the library I'm going to use for pulling in information from the API. Okay, If you've never done any sort of API web stuff in Python, requests is you go to library, it's fantastic. Um, counter that I'm going to use later on. Category tree is a little bit of code I wrote for dealing with categories in Foursquare. Um, that too you can find on GitHub somewhere if you get into doing stuff with Foursquare and categories. And I've got a, an access token that essentially grants me access to my own data. Um, so you can go to Foursquare, you can register an app, do a bit of authentication, and you'll get access to your own data. So that's what I'm. That's what I, all I've got there. Uh, so I'm just going to run that, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in my most recent check-ins, uh, and I'm going to copy and paste this rather than type it because it's all it's quite a lot of code. Um, so I've got some 
parameters for my API call. These are defined by Foursquare. Essentially, I have to supply this authorization token to say I'm allowed to access my own data. Um, all Foursquare requests also need an API version. This can be essentially any date, and their, their API is version by date, so if you use the same date, you should always get the same API response, essentially, even if they update the API. Um, and eventually, old enough dates get deprecated and don't work anymore. Um, this is how Brilliant Requests is for doing this kind of thing. If I want to get all my check-ins from Foursquare, I literally just say, hey, request, go and get this address. Here's the parameters for it. And then I just pull JSON data out. It's like two lines of code um, to make the request and get the response out. And then all I'm doing is just a little bit of fiddling to count essentially how many check-ins we've got back and how many check-ins there are in total. So, right, so we've got 250 check-ins back, which is surprising because that's how many I asked for in the parameters. Uh, so give me 250. And in total, there's 14,600 check-ins in my profile, right? So there's quite a lot of data there. So what I can do is quite easily grab another few lines of Python. And all I'm going to do is until I've got essentially all of my check-ins, I'm going to keep calling this thing, uh, but with an offset. So I'm going to step through all of my check-ins, 250 at a time, grabbing the next 250 and keep going until I end up with all of my check-ins in a list. So I'm going to run that. It's going to take um, a couple of seconds. So rather than watching it count up, what we'll do is uh, I'll show you a, a bit of other data. Uh, the Foursquare API doesn't just allow you access to individuals' check-ins data. It also allows you access to venue data. And part of that venue data includes how many people are at that venue at any one time. So if you build a list of all the venues in a city and keep going around all those venues, asking them how many people are there, how many people are there, essentially you can build up a sort of picture of how active the city is in terms of its venues. And if you do this over multiple weeks, what you can do is kind of build up a picture of how active the city is and what the city is like. And that's exactly what we did for a few months. Um, I don't know when, 2011, I'm guessing, probably. We monitored Cardiff, um, most of the venues, if not all the venues in Cardiff, sort of polling them once every 10, 15 minutes to find out how many people were there. And we built up this picture. Um, this is a typical weekday in Cardiff in terms of Swarm check-ins, Foursquare check-ins, and what's going on. Um, fairly easy to understand pattern. Big spike in the morning as people get up. Uh, a lot of people checking in at home or work. Uh, a few people going out for breakfast. Uh, people starting to go shopping, perhaps. Big spike lunchtime in the food category as people go out for lunch. Um, and then a bit of a spike in the evening as people go out for an after work drink, perhaps, nightlife spots. And then that nightlife spots kind of carries on throughout the evening, as well as a bit of food. Um, and the workplaces kind of tail off. Colleges and universities, again, a bit of a spike at morning and, morning and afternoon. Um, so that's the weekday in Cardiff. Weekend, a bit different. You see a subtle shift as everybody's having a little bit of a lie in. Um, there's no big spike at home or work in the morning. People, I guess, aren't going to work because it's the weekend. Um, quite a lot of shops and then a huge chunk of nightlife spots, right? Starting 11 a.m. ish and carrying on into the early hours, right? So in Cardiff, people are hitting it hard at lunchtime and carrying on until the, the late evening. We were also doing this work at the same time with some colleagues from the computer lab at Cambridge. Um, and we monitored Cambridge over the same period. Weekdays look very similar, the activity is slightly less, um, except for the fact that there's a massive tail off after about 9, 10 o'clock. So Cambridge, a lot more responsible. People are going to bed earlier. Um, the actual proportion of university check-ins is a bit higher, as you'd expect. Um, but otherwise, we've got the three peaks, right? We've got the morning peak, wake up, the lunchtime peak, and then the evening peak isn't quite as bad. Uh, the weekend check-ins, um, there's not a lot of nightlife going on in Cambridge. It's a lovely, lovely town, um, but we don't have quite the same drag on into the evening. So this is kind of interesting because it shows that with just a little bit of data monitoring, we can start to kind of get an idea of 
how cities differ from one another, how these cities are as places, um, the kind of activity that goes on inside these cities, and all this can start to build this, this rich picture that we're interested in um, if, we're, if we're looking at different places. Uh, so if we go back to our diary and our you know, wanting to look at what individuals are doing, hopefully we now have all of the check-ins Where's my, there we go, so if we go down, yep, yeah, we've got all of our check-ins. So that's great. So we have all of the check-ins. So we can really easily do a little bit of manipulation. Um, I've got a list of everywhere I've been for the last few years. I could quite easily use a counter. Um, if you don't want to count anything in Python, it's the obvious choice. Um, and I'm just going to go through all my check-ins find the venue and essentially store the ID in my counter and uh, count how many times that particular venue crops up. Um, so I do that and then the, count, the, the reason counters are brilliant rather than just like using a dictionary and adding numbers in is you actually get a bunch of helpful, uh, helpful methods with them. So I can do something like uh, print venue counter dot most common and pick top 15 venues, let's say, and so those are my top 15 venues. Um, not very useful because those are four square IDs. Um, have to do all the counting by IDs, not names, because names and places change. So you know, a few years ago, this was just the School of Computer Science, and so the check-ins from a few years ago might just be the School of Computer Science, not the School of Computer Science and Informatics. So we do it by ID, not name, and then just convert it to name. Um, I'm not giving anything away by telling you what my top, that's going to be my top venue. Um, told you all I do nowadays is just go to work and then go home. Um, so they're my top two venues. Uh, two railway stations, one near my house, one near my work. Um, so that's me being lazy and not cycling to work. Uh, I check in on the barrage when I do cycle to work. That's about half the time of the train, which is a bit. It's not ideal. Uh, Sainsbury's the closest place to get a sandwich. Uh, nursery, dropping my son off. Shops. The problem is that for anybody who does swarm and four square check-ins a lot, your most common places aren't really places. right? They're not places that reveal anything. They're places that everybody everybody goes to a train station. right? At some point, everyone gets on a train. They don't tell us anything about a person. right? No, there's nothing specific um, about me in here. Loads and loads of people. Loads and loads of people work or come here the school every day, right? Loads and loads of people will go to the train station. Loads and loads of pe people will go to Sainsbury's. There's nothing exciting about these places. The things that start to make it a bit unique come in further down. Things like, oh, Cine Cineworld, okay, that's actually a venue. The gym, the pilot. Um, Windsor Fruit Stores, perhaps not so much. The Millennium Off License. Sounds worse than it is. That was my local corner shop. That was like buying milk, not always going around there for booze. Um, yeah, so that's not that's not great. But the thing about Foursquare is all of the venues have categories, right? I mentioned this before. Venues have a type. You can say, you know, this is a shoe shop, this is a clothes shop, this is a thrift store, this is a dive bar, this is a jazz bar, this is a um, club, this is a pub. So what we can do is do something like pull out. This is why this category tree comes in handy because all of the categories are actually arranged in a hierarchical tree. Uh, we have nine root categories, uh, things like colleges and universities, nightlife, the, the categories that I showed you on those, on those um, plots before. So we can pull out all of the venues that happen to be in the nightlife category, whose parent, ultimate parent, is nightlife. And see, I've been to 268 different places that would categorize themselves as, as nightlife. And then we could count those up instead of just looking at all the venues. And now we can see something perhaps a little bit more interesting. So my most common nightlife venue is The Pilot, which is a lovely pub in Panath. It's my local. It's about five minutes away. If you've never been, go. Food's really good. Beer's really good. Um, Rummer Tavern used to be the starting point for a night out, for PhD nights out. Um, Duke of Wellington and the City Arms were probably where we'd end up at the end of a night out. Uh, Tiny Rebel Cardiff, Brewdog Cardiff, kind of 
current bars, Ochi Lounge is a place in Penarth, but you can quite easily see now just from the, the type of places I go for nightlife, there's a clear swing towards real ale craft beer, right? Now we can start to picture who I am as an individual. Um, and we can do this for different categories and start to pick up on different types of, of individuals. The other nice thing I like about Foursquare is we can uh, do something like look at all the check-ins in terms of when they happened and essentially recreate the idea of a diary that lists what you did when, right? I don't know what I did yesterday, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure I was just at home most of the day. Um, Today I went, came from home to work. I assume after this there will be a trip to the pub because it's pie diff and that's what we do. Um, and then I'll go home. But I can't remember what I did years and years ago. So that's, it would be quite easy to have a look. Let's see what I did on this date in 2011. Go back to 2011, 17th of January. I went to work and that was it. I didn't even go home, or if I went home, I didn't check in at home. So not, not quite an, uh, such an interesting day. Uh, we'll try a year later. A year later is better. A year later is better. Uh, looks like a nice little trip to, uh, to Bristol on the 17th of January. A couple of bars, uh, somewhere to eat, I guess. Probably one of those. Stay in a hotel. Nice. Um, a couple of years later exciting, an exciting day, starting off with a trip to the storage company. Okay, so like I'd, I'd even forgotten that I had a storage unit at one point, but I did, and I went there. Okay, so this is kind of, this is a bit of fun, but, but interesting. Um, so, obviously, if people are going to be logging all this stuff in Foursquare, if we can get access to that, then we have a huge amount of information, right? Because we can see how they move around a place. We can see how they move around a city. Um, and if we can get that for lots of people, we can start to understand patterns within cities, across cities, and we can start to look for individual characteristics. Uh, so we did the only sensible thing and thought, well, a nice little experiment gave us access to, um, gave us access to people's Twitter feeds. Can we do the same for Foursquare and build an experiment? And if we do, what are we going to get people to do? We're not going to get people to compare places. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to give them a personality test, okay? Which is where I now, having mangled the recognition heuristic, now mangled the five-factor personality model, which my understanding of it is, it is a fairly accepted model for personality as much as anything is ever accepted in psychology, which is saying something. But essentially, what we can do, and this is why we like it, as computer scientists and people that are interested in, in other people using computer systems is we can essentially give people a test and get five numbers that we can use to classify them, right? That's what we're interested in. We can give them a test, we can get five numbers, and then we can say, okay, all you people have got low values of this, where have you gone? If you've got a low value of this, maybe we'll predict that you can go somewhere else. So the five-factor model is five factors. Big openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, sometimes called ocean, sometimes called canoe, hence my very clever slide. Um, quick run through what the things are. Openness is about your openness to experience, your originality, right? So somebody who's high is going to be quite artistic. Somebody who's low is going to be quite conservative. Um, you test this by asking people how well they agree with statements like, I am someone who values artistic experiences or is curious about many different things. Um, Conscientiousness is about your organization, your diligence. Um, people who are low in conscientiousness like to be spontaneous but disorganized. People who are high in conscientiousness tend to be quite focused, quite organized. Um, and you ask people how much they agree with the fact that they are someone who does a thorough job or can be somewhat careless and so on. Extroversion is probably one of the more um, well understood by people characteristics, because people are always talking about being extroverted or introverted. Um, but if you are low in extroversion, then you're quite reserved, shy, perhaps. If you're high in extroversion, you kind of seek social interactions. You're quite outgoing. And you assess that with by asking people how much they agree that they are talkative or reserved or full of energy. Agreeableness. Um, if you are have a low 
agreeableness, you're likely to be quite argumental, you're likely to be quite competitive. I would like to say most academics probably fall somewhere towards the bottom end of this spectrum. Um, certainly the ones, some of the ones I know. Um, if you are less, if you are more agreeable, you're likely to be more trusting, um, empathetic. And you assess this by asking, I'm someone who tends to find fault with others or starts quarrels with others and so on. And finally, neuroticism, which is slightly weird in the scale in that the kind of socially acceptable end of it is the, the low end rather than the high end. So it's kind of switched. For all the others, the, the social norm is to be really extroverted and agreeable and outgoing and, and open, um, but have low neuroticism, which means you're very emotionally stable. Whereas high neuroticism, prone to stress, prone to worry. And we assess this with asking, I'm someone who is depressed or can be tense and so on. So you can ask these questions, people say, how much do you agree with this? Essentially add up some numbers, do a bit of maths, you get five numbers. Um, there's been a lot of research into the five factor model, probably because it is quite easy to get a handle on, it's quite easy to implement and give to lots and lots of people. And then you can do things like compare it to people's Twitter posts and compare it to people's Facebook posts and do some simple image recognition on Instagram and compare it to their Instagram posts. And it's very easy to suddenly knock up a conference paper where you say, we gave the five factor personality test to 500 Facebook users and then we compared their Facebook profiles and we can say that everybody who's open posts a lot things like that, right? Um, so there's been a lot of research in social media on how personality relates to your usage of social media, but not in terms of location-based social networks. So not in terms of Swarm, Foursquare, which are slightly different because you can't do them sat behind a computer, right? You can't check into a whole bunch of places sat at home. You have to go out and be there. Um, I mean, you can cheat, but I don't know why anybody would. Um, so the idea was we, we could have a look at how these personality factors relate to one another, how they relate to individuals, and try and come up with some hypotheses. Um, I've got agreeableness twice. Um, so we thought openness would be positively correlated with high diversity venues. If you are open, you're going to go to more places, right? Seems reasonable. If you're open to experiences, you're going to seek out more experiences. You're probably going to object into more places. We thought conscientiousness would be negatively correlated with number of check-ins. If you're conscientious, you're diligent, you're focused, you're organized, you're not going to be distracted by social media when you're out and about. You go into the pub to go to the pub, you're not going to the pub to check in. If you're extroverted, we think you'll probably go to a large number of places that are sociable, right? Um, seems reasonable. Agreeableness, we thought if there was going to be a link, maybe you could see a link with the popularity of venues. If you are less agreeable, you're only going to go to popular places because you know if you go to somewhere that's less popular, you're going to end up in a fight with a waiter. Um, and the fifth one is actually neuroticism. Um, we figured neuroticism would be negatively correlated with the number of places that you go to. So if you are highly neurotic, um, you would not seek as much social interaction, perhaps go to fewer places. So I did the same thing as with Twitter. Built uh, another Python Django experiment. Source code for this, interestingly, is not online. I do have it. I shall put it online. I will stick it on GitHub. Um, but I did the same thing for the Tweepy one as I did for the Django, uh, for the Foursquare one, and had an app, a basic app that allowed you to log in with Foursquare. So if you want Foursquare integration in the Django app, again, there's a really old skeleton that will need a lot of um, bringing up to, up to date. And this was the app we built, Foursquare Personality. Now, it is still online. It does not work. Um, it needs a, a slight update, and, and then it will work again, and you can go and have a go with it. Um, so what I'll do is I'll probably tweet about it from the PyDiff account or something once it's up and running, hopefully next week or the week after or something. Um, but the idea was much like Twitter, you'd need a Foursquare account, you need to have used that account. You go along, you sign in with Foursquare, and you take a personality test. So we give you this personality test, ask you how much you agree, disagree with various statements, and then we present you with some information. Uh, so we present you with your personality profile, and we present you with the average personality profile of the area where you happen to be. So looking at all the different people who've also checked into the same places as you or places in your area, what's the average personality in that area? And then you can pick any individual place and compare your personality to all the other people who've been to that place. Uh, so picking the School of Computer Science and Informatics, we can see that um, the average computer scientist in blue um, is a lot less extroverted than the average person in, in, in Cardiff, right? So computer scientists, a bit more introverted. Not really a shocking result. 
I'm slightly more extroverted than most of the computer scientists. Uh, agreeableness, everybody's pretty much the same. It's not really any difference. Conscientiousness, I'm really conscientious. Fantastic. Uh, computer scientists, a little bit more conscientious than the average. Neuroticism, I'm much more neurotic than computer scientists and the average for the area. But I'm also quite a lot more open, which I think is fair enough. I'm stood up revealing the results of a personality profile to a room and streaming it online. Um, so that was what people got out of it, a bit of fun, you know, and then you can, you know, go and click on a bar and see that everybody there was really neurotic and so you don't want to go to that bar or, you know, whatever, just a, a little bit of a toy. But it means what we got is a lot of check-in data for people. We actually got almost half a million check-ins. So each dot on the map is a place in the world that we have at least one or two, I think, personality profiles for. Um, so we got quite a, quite a lot of data. Um, and once the experiment is online and updated a little bit, we might even be able to collect a bit more. Looking at personality profiles in terms of um, their distributions, a bit of matplotlib, um, just to show that there's nothing strange compared to like lots of other personality tests that have happened. There doesn't seem to be anything weird about people who use Foursquare, which is good. It's reassuring, I guess, if you use Foursquare, that you know, as a group of people, there's nothing too far outside the ordinary. Um, but it's not the people in the middle we actually care about. When we're looking at this, what we wanted to look at was these people at the extremes. We divide everybody into three equal groups, all the personality profiles, and we care about the people who are really low or really high on the scale. Right? The people in the middle bore us, they're average, we don't care, we just want the extremes. Um, so what we can do is we could take the, take the extremes, take the people with low openness, the people with high openness, look at the the, um, look at their profile in terms of how many venues they've been to, how many venues in each category they've been to, where they've been to, the type of venues they've been to, and so on, and see if there are any big differences, and see if there's any support for any of our hypotheses. Um, this, we see throughout all of our results, um, high conscientiousness means higher X, whatever X is, pretty much. Um, we thought conscientiousness would mean you're focused, you're not going to get distracted by social media. It turns out conscientious means you're very organized, you're always going to remember to check in. Um, we, were, we had that one completely backwards. Um, strangely enough, high agreeableness means you've got fewer check-ins for some reason. No idea why. Um, different number of venues. We expected high openness to mean you've been to more places. Didn't see anything there. Again, the same conscientious thing, because you're always remembering to check in. Uh, neuroticism, high neuroticism means you've been to fewer places, which um, is kind of interesting. We thought it would relate to the number of check-ins. It actually relates to the number of different places. Um, check-in diversity, uh, so we can like calculate diversity measures from um, ecology to say how kind of diverse your range of places you've been to is. And we see nothing except for the usual conscientiousness. Um, so that was a waste of time. Sociable venues, we thought this would be related to extroversion. Being more extrovert, you go to more sociable places. Um, we even did a Crowdflower experiment where we took all of the categories for Foursquare and put them online and asked people to pick whether they were sociable or not. And we did pay a fair amount of money to come up with a definitive list of places that are sociable and not sociable. Um, so for instance, only Actually, some people were doing things like saying a bus is a sociable place, which is quite strange. But um, So we came up with a list of places that are sociable. Um, and again, it had nothing to do with extroversion. There was nothing, nothing there. Again, conscientiousness. There was a thing with neuroticism. So if you are neurotic, you're probably likely to go to fewer sociable places, which again makes sense and is kind of related to one of our hypotheses. Um, so that was a, a cool bit of analysis. and. Kind of the first study that's that's really looked at personality in places in this kind of way, and we did find some links between four of the personality facets and places and mobility. Nothing for extroversion, um, and none of it relates to how normal social media is used, which is kind of interesting. Um, so just the final little thing I'm going to talk about um, is what one of our PhD students is, has gone on to do. Um, again. Nice bit of analysis that's all happened in Python. Building a graph of all these users that we have, um, 
where the nodes are the users and the edges are how many common places they have between them. So we can take each node as a user with a personality profile and then we can put a link if they've been to the same place. So this no node 54 and node 12 have been to 21 common places. Um, node 54 and node 74 have only been to three common places. And then what we can do is start to compare whether or not there's anything in the personality and the number of places that you share um, that, that ties people together. And actually from doing a big analysis on this, what she's found is that people with high agreeableness, high openness, and high conscientiousness go to the same places as each other. Um, people with high neuroticism do not socialize with each other. So there seems to be something with neurotics that they're all avoiding each other. Um, so that's, again, a little bit more further work that's a bit interesting. Um, that's one of the papers we published on this. Um, yeah, there you go, a couple of years ago now. Um, there's a link to more of them, if anybody's interesting. I'm not going to be mean to the psychologists, but these ten type of papers are basically just stats. There's lots and lots of tables of stats. It's a bit dull. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, any questions? I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine that it's all collected along with everything that's done online anyway, right? Um, but I will say that in order to get access through the API to people's check-ins, you need to get their permission, right? So the law enforcement agencies might be doing it by the back door anyway. Um, but to actually get somebody's check-ins, you need to, they need to authorize your app. So it's not easy to do. Um, just with the API. There did used to be a security hole in the Foursquare API. When telling you information about a venue, they wouldn't just tell you how many people were there, they would tell you which users were there. So only in terms of their name and the first letter of their surname, but often that's quite enough, that's enough to identify people in a given area. Um, so you could actually track individual movements through the API with no authentication, um, but they, they closed that pretty quickly. Yes. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. Maybe it's the app. Yeah, yeah. You get. You, you might have missed this. Yeah. So and so. All oh, right. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, probably. I tend to only use TweetDeck, so I don't think I see m most of that. That's interesting. Recognize the value of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we we picked the initial idea was we'd do the, the um, five factor and then we'd look at lots of other different types of psychological tests so we could build a little bit more. You, I mean, you've got what was, you've got things like need for cognition and things like that that could be easily tested for, and, and so we were going to do that. It would be interesting to, I mean, theoretically, the five factor model self-reporting is the same as if you get people's friends to do it for them, right? Should be. Um, so it might be interesting to have a social aspect, you know, get people to take the test and then say, okay, now invite five of your friends to rate you. And it would be a good way of spreading the experiment as well, actually. Um, but no, we didn't didn't manage to do any of that. Um, ran out of time on those sorts of things. Um, what was the last part of your question, sorry? It was Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, there, there wasn't... Not, not necessarily what you did, because I, I yeah, yeah. you were constrained by time and resource. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we could have, so I'm not, obviously I'm not hugely aware of a lot of stuff. I do know there are larger, so we used a particular personality test that's only 45 items, I think, 44 items, something like that. Um, we could have used a bigger test, perhaps, that would have got us some more, um, more precise, but then we would have got perhaps fewer people actually finishing the test and dropping out, which would have reduced the data, yeah. Yep. Right at the start, um, you were <coughs> talking about um, seeking uh, a kind of uh, emotional response from yes. the stuff that, that we uh, are receiving and how we don't just want to uh, have stuff that reflects us. Um, and yet, in the data that you have from this, uh, these location systems, there's a kind of leveling out of experience in there. And you're talking about the, the personality test, and you've already raised some questions about that, but the idea that this is giving us a picture of who you are in any way, I think is, uh, could be into question because I think, you know, I'd be, what would tell me about you is that, you know, um, which you would consider to be the best possible starting fight scene, or, you know, or, or, and, and yeah. so, you know something that, that ha represents a kind of peak on, on that emotional response, or yep. not even yeah, yeah, yeah. films or films of a certain type, but, yeah. you know, was there one film you saw that changed yes. your mind about something, you know, and that seems to be a story that's really important that is never going to be told by this information, whatever yeah. you do with it. Yeah, no, it's, it's true, yeah. But all we're capturing is, in the case of the places we're capturing visits, we're not capturing why, we're not capturing what happened. Yeah, you're right, you're it's, it's a lot of the experience. Yeah, are. yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, it would be nice to have some sort of further level of engagement, but I mean, short of, then we're going to people writing stuff down or us following people with a camera for a long time, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's very difficult to do this kind of large scale study and get that level of detail out, I think. Yeah. 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 But then a lot of, I mean, we've talked about this before. I'm sure I've talked about to you about it. Trying to link between social networks is just an incredibly hard, hard task. Yeah. Yeah. And so many APIs, terms and conditions explicitly forbid trying to match people between social networks, um, which is tricky. On that topic, if anybody is doing any work looking at matching, uh, following people between social networks. Um, there is a special issue of a journal. The deadline is coming up in March, I think, um, ex on exactly that, following, user, following human pathways. It's about trying to link people between social networks and follow their digital trail. Um, yeah, so you might want to have a look at that. Yeah, that would be interesting, but yeah, at the moment it's not something we, we can do. Yeah. Um, there's a very noticeable line down the middle of America. Any idea why that is? I mean, is there nothing there? Not I think there is pretty much nothing there, right? And my American geography is pretty poor, but I'm I'm thinking this is like this is all prairie and mountains and the Rockies and things, isn't it? It's yeah. all yeah, it's fairly sparse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's that. I don't think it's just like, like Foursquare just doesn't work here. I think it's yeah, just sparsely sparse inhabited. Yeah, same reason we can't see the Sahara, right? Yeah. 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 Y
No, no, no. There are there are a fair few places that are quite dark. Um, yeah, it's typical smartphone app distribution, I guess. Cool. Okay, thank you, everybody.